It is July the 1st, 2023, and this is the future of photography. The future of photography. Hello, hello, hello. I'm Chris, and with us are Adrian and Jeremiah. Hello. 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 How's everyone doing on this well, well, better well. day? I'm, I'm Summer. Good. Yeah, I'm good. I've had a busy day, lots of family stuff going on. I've just sat down in my seat literally two minutes before we press record. So, I, so hope, you guys have planned, I hope you guys have planned a podcast for us. I, I, I think I think we do have some preparation here. Um, we for do, we do. So, yeah. Jeremiah, you made the suggestion to talk about... I did. Uh, since, since, since uh, you know, we've been kind of uh, dwelling for uh, a lot of our time in the world of, I shall not mention its name again, AI, but I thought it would be handy to kind of do a deep dive into handmade processes, alternative. Counter, counterpoint, so to speak. That's it. Uh, images with one's fingerprints on them, because I, I actually believe that as we you know get ready for what will be a not just a tidal wave but a massive tidal wave of of images generated by um very modern techniques uh, you know considering AI, which we'll not mention again, um, <laughs> twice I'll, in one I'll minute. Have a counter in the corner, and every time no, it's a drinking game. game. It'll be a drinking game. Um, that that, and I think this is true in every medium that will be influenced by you know machine learning and, and language models. Is the fingerprints of the artist, the man-made artisanal aspect of the creative process? will possibly r rise to the top as cream does, but certainly um, attract, if not a niche market or a niche audience, uh, but a fascination of what is lost in the I, I process. Think, I think, honestly, the, the, the alternative analog handmade stuff is an important part of the future of photography. I think it will... It will. It's. It might become less, but its value will uh, rise quite a bit. Yes, we agree a thousand percent on this, and 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 I think not only in photography but in music certainly. Um, I, I know. Some, <laughs> I know some people working on, on you know, creating a, a a venue of handmade instruments played by people and and songs you know created and written by by people. Um, that that as, shouldn't uh, be necessary. That really shouldn't be necessary. <laughs> Music has always been that way. <laughs> it has been, but but you know we are in an interregnum now, and I think that all alternative processes, whether it's you know poetry or or you know image making, um, songwriting, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, movie making. Um, I think there is a attraction, possibly even in filmmaking, um, to instead of using CG, maybe using models, you know, actually constructed models and, and just see how how the feeling will return once things are made with, you know, puppets and miniatures and all of that kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, returning us back to photography, which is our stock and trade here, um, the exploration of these things is... A, absolute um, joy if you're into photography of any kind um, because it puts you into a process and I am always encouraging of process as a way to sublimate into flow uh, which is you know a, a kind of a buzzword on the creative energy and connection to the sublime and more important just a way of forgetting all the chaos that's happening in the world well needed so. yes <laughs> for me for, for me doing doing just just in general analog work developing pl working with the chemicals measuring out uh, the 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 ratio of water to developer and uh, and getting everything at the right temperature and then take counting the minutes until this thing is done and 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 uh, moving things around in the right rhythm it, it is there is a flow in there it it really it really kind of removes me from everything else so clearly mm. I, I i clearly get that yes 
ha, ha, some of the happiest moments of my life when I was developing uh, skills as a photographer early yeah. days and then was and, in darkroom and and then at the end um ju just just uh, not even the darkroom just uh, the the first part of the process where I develop film that moment that culmination of everything you've done in the so to speak in the dark without seeing what's happening but kind of feeling it's like baking a cake you put it in the oven and then you have to trust the process right <laughs> and then you open up um, the canister and you pull out this negative and it's it, it, it's it's hard to describe um, the the joy that you get and the satisfaction you get from seeing there is something on my negatives I did a good job and <laughs> often often the relief the, and and some relief there. <laughs> but but what we want to talk about today is um, alternative print processes so what we have is typic typically what we would typically do is um in in film photography and the longest process that has been around is silver gelatin printing so if you see that that is pretty much um the, the standard these days you have a paper that is coated with the reason it's called silver gelatin is because in a gelatin emulsion there is um there is uh, light sensitive uh silver halides um, suspend it and they they coat that paper and then it dries and then that is what gets exposed and then uh, developed so this is the most popular process this has been around for well for for all almost all photography or at least for for many decades for mo call it for the modern world of photography Yes, you know we can we can start there. Really, but then there are alternatives. There are processes that are not that usual anymore, and that are being um, that are being used by, let's say, curious minds who want a different way to get a piece of uh, paper to show a photograph and and to fix that. A no, no, type is one. Yeah. By the way, not only uh, paper. But oh yeah, it, other materials it, as well. As, yeah, as, as long as you have an emulsion, that you can put it on many things, yes. sure. including T-shirts and things. So cyanotype. Let's start with cyanotype. It's a very old process. Um, it's pretty much the, the the basis for what we call blueprints, right? Um, so we have some iron-based uh, chemistry. It's pretty non-toxical. So um, I remember as a kid. To play with cyanotype, you can actually buy like this paper that you put out in the sun, put something sure. on it, be a, a few rocks and this, some feathers and some <clears throat> other things, and, and leave it out in the sun for ten minutes, and then you develop that in water, and you um, end up with these deep blue um, prints. Sure, I, I've um, experimented uh, with with that process, but not by getting my, my hands wet or my paper exposed by sun. But just exploring that, I found a, a, a company in the US, I forget, it's now going five or six years, where I was uh, exploring uh, printing uh, using uh, a company that uh, prints blueprints, very, very big blueprints. And like, like architectural engineering type of blueprints? Yes. And, and sending them uh, files, JPEGs actually, um, to create massive, <laughs> massive prints for like, you know, $20, right? <laughs> Very inexpensive. But the results were absolutely beautiful. If if the imagery is is right, and that was very kind of connected to the cyanotype uh, process. I mean, it's the same basic. Is that, is that still around? Thing. Can you still get yeah. these done? Like, oh yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, you should find an architectural printing firm near you. I'm I'm sure they would accommodate. Um, so uh, one could explore some of these processes either hands on or. Um, kind of arm's length, but, but they do influence the kind of imagery one takes and how one delivers it. Um, and I, I think it's always fun to dig into the connection between the aesthetic, the intention, the capture, and the final result. And, and 
taking a single image and printing it multiple different ways using different techniques and creates a different emotional response. By the way, cyanotype is also wonderful if you want to get your kids involved in photography because they can they can touch it. They can you you get the you can get the paper already coated. Sure, it comes in a black bag, and then you can yeah again play with stuff, some fern or something from the garden that you put on there, and uh, the kids have a memento, a, photo, a photographic experience, which is wonderful. The first woman to create a photograph, um, by the way, Anna Atkins, she is cyanotype. She was, uh, and she and she also released one of the first f books f illustrated with photography about algae and seaweed. How about that? Oh, yes. uh, I have a question for you. Uh, do you think that the, pro the this particular process came from a scientific uh, focus or from an artistic focus? <laughs> that That's is a, a very question. good question. I don't know. I, I was listening to a podcast the other day where somebody said, "How did that? How was bronze invented? Like, did somebody accidentally leave leave some tin and some <laughs> in a fire? To, in a fire? <laughs> and it's just like, yeah. Or, or was it intentional? Was it an accident? Or was it intentional? I, I, I don't know. And do you know what? The other thing I worry thinking about things like French pastry. Who on earth had the idea for that? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's you know, like a meal foy is not something that magically appears in uh, uh, here's out of my, nowhere. Here's I, my theory. <laughs> it is, of course, a non sequitur, but my theory is they had very little dough left, so they had to yeah, they had to make it, it, it spread <laughs> it thin, uh, and, and that's how it happened. On, on the on the Bronze Age, the Sumerians, uh, I think it came out of their culture. I think, Think I could be wrong. Please uh, correct me on the Discord it, it, if I'm it, wrong. Yeah, it's more about like, is it, was it an idea or not? So, so tell us for, for cyanotypes. Was uh, that well? No, you, I'm, I'm talking bronze. I, I think that people were a lot more sophisticated and and focused and and experimental. Or they had a lot more time on their hands. And, they did and, and experimented did. a lot more. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, for example. Um, yeah, they had a piece of tin. God knows where they found that. And they, they, they said, Cold oh, wolf. it melts. What else can we add to the soup? And before you know it, we had great weapons. <laughs> okay. Um, let, me, let me pick one other uh, process out of this list, not necessarily in the order we have it in our document. Um, it's, it is a, here's a process that I never really got around to, um, but I've I've done some research into and talked to people who did it, and that's brome oil printing. Has any of you done that? Because I find this really fascinating. So I I don't know what it is. I haven't. Uh, so, so 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 here here's how this goes, and the name comes from bromide paper and an oil based ink. So you have you you pretty much develop a photo in a way that doesn't put that, that that doesn't make the dark parts black it's all white it's all it you don't see the photo but what you do by that specific process is you create a relief so the the darker parts are a bit higher there are the hills and then the brighter parts are the valleys and with that you then put this oil-based ink on with brushes and you pat it on and you you blot it on in some way and it's a very very intense process it takes a long time and you and and then of course the the raised parts which are the darker ones they they take up more color than the lower parts and and in this way you you have a lot of control it's a slow process it takes ages it's a very um a very artistic process because you have a lot of control over what you do. You can also work with colors, as in color. So you can have different parts of the picture in different colors. And in the end, um, it's pretty much like an oil painting because it's an oil-based ink, but it's a photograph. And I've seen some bromoil prints that blew me away. So um, very, very interesting one and and very artistic super artistic but it, it creates a photograph i mean i i've i've done uh which is another process that i've listed uh and maybe i didn't put it in this notes but uh, a gravure process uh and i you know when in the 70s i experimented with creating uh photo emulsions um and coating uh 
stones, lithography stones, uh, with photo emulsion, uh, and using the the process of stone lithography, which is uh, basically flattening parts of a stone, creating a uh, call it a resin or stickiness to absorb ink in various quantities. Uh, those quantities then would be coated and then printed uh, with a specific press uh, for just stunningly beautiful prints. Um, and uh, did the same with gravure. And, la and last year I did an experiment where, where I did uh, some gravure uh, printing, which necessitates coating, uh, coating a, a plate, I think it was a zinc plate, um, with a photosensitive material, baking it um, af uh, after being exposed, not unlike a platinum print, contact print, uh, and then based on the uh, based on the amount of light that is kind of moving through the negative, that creates a condition of absorption, let's call it. This is a very, very kind of quick and easy way to think about it. And then one coats the plate with ink, oil-based ink, uh, and um, using damp paper, which has been soaking probably for about 24 hours, um, and then put through a gravure press to imprint the image, so it's the opposite of relief, it's actually em embossed negatively in the paper, but it is uh, some of the most uh, outstanding and incredible, certainly in the blacks, because you have the richest kind of ink, and it, it is more or less, I'm not going to say it's continuous tone, but it, it is very specific looking and draws from, you know, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years of, of, uh, of etching and gravure printing. Um, so that, that is a, a very interesting process that is quite elaborate because you need a lot of different <laughs> huge presses and <laughs> baking and zinc and tin. But um, uh, I've worked with John Cohn, who makes uh, inks for my piezo, uh, and he's developed a more modern way of of doing that so the pie piezography that is that is an ink ink jet type of um print yeah it? yeah it's an all it's actually a modern alternative process right. where wherein if you if you know the zone by system, the way when we say alternative we mean an alternative to the silver gelatin process yeah, which is the predominant one that, right that's so correct you have to make that clear they are all very different right that's right. Uh, you know, piezo uh, requires an adapted uh, printer uh, with a very specific uh, CPU, uh, which allocates the correct amount of ink, uh, which is all controllable using uh, effectively a modern zone system uh, so that your computer controls, you know, in the midtones a little more gray and it's generally a black and white uh, process though there are I haven't used the color but I, I do use the black and white and it it allows first of all the inks which are carbon based very very intensely um, uh, colored in other words you could have the deepest black cold to a warm warm kind of mid-tone call it gray, but it's more sepia. And you could actually mix these. So you could have a cold black and a cold highlight and a mid-tone that's more warm. Very subtle, but I'll allocate the exact amount of ink uh, onto the print. Um, it's, it's a, it takes a while to get it kind of up and organized, but it makes images like lithography. I'll I'll put something along those lines into our uh, in our, into our picks later because um, it just came to me that um, there's a okay well we'll talk about that part later. Um, <laughs> has any of you ever had a collodion wet plate picture taken of them? Because I have. 
I wanted to, but I haven't. So, so, so this was this was uh, years ago in Toronto at a gallery, and there's a, a small team who make collodion wet plate photography, and um, they offered to take pictures of people, and they they set everything up. So, uh, wet plate collodion is from the from the 1850s. Um, so it's a very old process, and it creates one of a kind pictures, as in a positive on uh, either a glass plate or, or more often on a metal plate. And uh, it takes a lot of UV light, and uh, which, which was kind of the basis for these very stiff type of portraits because people had to sit for minutes and not move. So we're all very cramped and sometimes even like, like clamped to the chairs. Um, and what these guys did is they had... They had a modern, I've, I don't even remember, 500 or 1,000 watt seconds flash system that they uh, used special bulbs in that were not UV protected. So they blasted you <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a fraction of a second with like all that UV you'd ever need for the entire day. <laughs> you didn't quite it get a sunburn. It doesn't sound very healthy. But, well, you didn't quite get a sunburn, but it was, it was enough light to, well... The alternative would have been to sit out in the sun for 10 minutes, and it was raining that day, so that was not that uh, possible. Here's a question. Uh, would you agree, and this is anecdotal, that my, my impression of alternative processes as the Eclodian process is probably the most popular, certainly one of the most popular alternative processes that is being used actively by a strong community? Yes, and the 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 reason I think is well, first of all, the the the, the kind of the contrasts, the, the 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 tones you get in it are very specific, very unique. Um, the other is it's also a very involved process because it's it's not called wet plate for a re for for no reason. <laughs> it is a process that where you have to um, to to coat the plate. And then you have to sensitize it. And it's, a, it's a, someone holds up that plate in their hand, and with the other hand, they have a bottle, they pour, and then they, they swash it around carefully, and uh, the surface tension keeps it on the plate. And then over one of the corners, they put the, the um, whatever is too much back in the bottle. And then that, that coating, the sensitizing, and uh, the... Um, the development and, and the exposure, exposing of the picture have to take place while the plate is wet. It, that's why it's a wet plate. So you, you, ha you have to have a mobile uh, dark room, pretty much. And it, re it really, this, this guy down in the basement, he had set up his little dark room and, uh, and, and brought the wet plate up. And you have maybe one, two, three minutes maximum. So... People are already there. A second person is readying the camera and readying the sitters, and then yeah. come. Then comes the plate in a in a light tight container, and it goes in and it takes a picture, and then off to the development because it has to happen within minutes. And it's an amazing kind of process. And uh, and then it would. I think they would coat it with a shellac or something over a flame so that that it was protected <laughs> from the elements. And, Weird, it's not a, amazing. Yeah, it's not unlike um, some of the experiments that I was involved with uh, with a group of artists who, um, in the early 70s, creating holograms where we mm -hmm. would do the very, very much the same thing. That's a very Co different alternative process, yeah. We would expose it by, by lasers on non-vibrating tables and then have you have to look at them with... Uh, a laser exposure, but what you would see when you look through the plate is exactly what you saw in 3D. I mean, it was uh, pretty dazzling, but again, uh, very involved. And again, the flow, and I speak both metaphorically and physically, of coating the emulsion, of pouring it back in the bottle, of, of exposing it, all trial and error initially. Um, but uh, the the wet plate process does create images that I believe are so powerful in our yes. emotional connection to the past. Mm 
And it's it's interesting because I mean we we know the aesthetics of a wet plate photo because we've seen them in documentaries and so on. But once once you hold one of those in your hand, it's a very different thing. You have this this wonderful combination of well, again the the deep blacks, the the contrast uh, the medium makes, um, and of course the a very like those cameras have typically have very like old. Petzval lenses and things that yeah. give you an interesting looking bokeh and a very shallow depth of field because they are one of a kind. So you have large surfaces to expose, which means very shallow depth of field. So you often have like the eyes in focus and the ears almost, almost out of focus again. It's yeah. very, very interesting look and feel. Sure, certainly uh, about the eyes, you notice in most most of them, the eyes, while they are in focus, are also blurred because people blink over the right. course of taking and the pictures. So there is a little bit of weirdness in the eyes, and that is consistent with um, Latter-day, certainly. Uh, and Latter another thing that I'm all, pretty, pretty much all of these processes, but wet plate uh, specifically, um, ch changes the contrast also because it's an orthochrom orthochromatic process, so it doesn't see red, and that means that uh, skin will be rendered in a very different way, like like uh, um, spots, things come out very differently. Freckles, uh, the freckles, 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 are freckles, magnified, amazing. Yeah. yeah. So you you have a very uh, interesting. Um, rendition of colors on that as well as gray tones yeah I, I i feel that this is a great kind of non sequitur again to discuss a you know we, we've talked about this often is the difference between an image and a document and right. when you hold hold a, a wet plate image you're holding a document an object rather than just looking at an uh, at a vision at a, at a image, it creates a completely different response, um, not only to the image, but to the whole process and to the history and to the value and the specificity and the uniqueness of the object you hold. And I always, I always go back to that document versus image as something that is a powerful um, aspect of photography and not often discussed, um, especially in the light of we won't speak its name, <laughs> AI, because we are used to um, seeing, yeah, there's three drinks. Um, um, you know, we, we, we experience the object only if it's kind of rendered back through printing in whatever aspect. And, and one of the things that fascinates me, of course, is the combination of new school image creation and old school printing and how they fuse to create something unique and different. Right. So let's see. Let's let's pick one more of these. Well, let, let me pick one more of these. If, if there's any of the, the ones on the list that you want to talk about, feel free to. But the one I want to pick out, because I find this also very interesting, is the Alp. Is it called albumen? Albumen. Albumen, yeah. Albumen egg -based. print. Egg-based. So <clears throat> it's an egg-based print. So <laughs> This this is also this is also from the I think it's even older than the wet plate. Uh, it's from 1847. Um, the French guy uh, invented that, and it is a, it is a photographic process that well uses the usual suspects in terms of um, exposure, uh, uh, light sensitive material. But the way it kept that structure on a paper was by egg whites. So. Um, we're looking at uh, a massive amount of eggs that were um, cracked for this kind of a process for making the paper. And um, the the in, in, during that time, the biggest place or the place that made most of this was Dresden in Germany. They were the main producer of album and paper. And allegedly, they, they had to crack around 70,000 chicken eggs per day. Wow. To create that. It is said that uh, in, in France, the city of Paris couldn't produce enough eggs for that process. So <laughs> just imagine yeah. the amount of the, the big chicken farms that are only there for photography. Isn't that um, wild? 
Wow. Well, I, I, I do have uh, one that I really want to throw to Adrian. Um, but, you know, of course, we could mention salt prints, which is another variation of, you know, using... Very, I think one of the earlier processes as well, yes. I think 18... Maybe the, maybe the earliest Earliest, one, yes. yeah, I, I think so. Um, I've studied those, uh, you know, the Getty has an amazing uh, collection of salt prints, and I... Oh, here, here are a few fun facts about salt prints. So the, I'll, I'll, I'll as, I might as well use them because I've written them down here. <laughs> um, so it goes down to the 1830s, a very old process. Um, and pretty much what you do is you paint uh, or you, you, you put salt solution, like table salt solution on a paper. And then um, you, you brush... Um, what was it? You you brush some some silver halide thing on it, which makes the uh, light sensitive thing out of that combination of the salt. That's why it's a salt print. And um, I just learned during that research why fixer is called hypo, because that's a very very usual term. Like how do you fix it? You use hypo, and hypo um, was uh, something that they found out would fix the shadows and it was hyposulfite of soda or um, in modern name it's sodium thiosulfate which is the the chem the, the the one chem chemistry that fixes or silver into Co commonly known as coca-cola interesting is it, is uh, it? no <laughs> i don't think so. <laughs> i don't think so not one of our sponsors i'm sure uh, i think pretty I sure coca-cola dissolves things rather than fixing <laughs> things pretty, well yeah, you, you know like... there there are some alternative chemistries um caffeinol for example where mm -hmm. the the, mm -hmm. the 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 coffee acid is the developing agent so coffee based developers work um, so I've never done that, but I know lots of people who have, and they say the instant coffee granules, yeah, you know, freeze dried coffee granules. Cheaper is, coffee is better because it <laughs> is more acidic. So the cheapest uh, instant coffee that you can find, and and it's it's a very smelly process, um, but yeah, it it does work. I've also seen um, a few years ago someone so, something went through the blogs um, where someone said they developed film in beer, which. Turns out they also added some uh, vitamin C. Or they thought they, okay. yeah. they yeah. thought they did. <laughs> vitamin C uh, or vitamin C is a developing agent, so that can develop um, film. So yeah. this alternative printing process I'm going to throw over to Adrian to talk about, and it's Instax or Polaroid. Oh, uh, well, yes, I've definitely, <laughs> definitely printed a load of those in my time. So that's it. That's interesting. You've put that in there. Well, um, I have, because it, in fact, it is an alternative it is, yes. process. It's self-contained, the chemistry, the paper, the print, it, it certainly all in is, one yes. little package. It certainly is. Um, it's uh, so, so the it's interesting, actually, because one of the things yeah, we've talked today about how involved the processes are. And of course, printing to Instax is, is not really an involved process except in the sense that it involves a lot of other people with big smiles on their faces. So, you know, you can, it, it, in, in the sense of, you know, the, the collodion stuff and other processes we talked about, yes, I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, you definitely do get a feel of connection to the work. And it's something I've thought of a lot, you know, the, the, it seems to be that the more the process is part of the creation of the artwork, the more connection you immediately feel to it. I think as... As a species, we value effort as much as the yeah. Sometimes as much as sometimes more than the creative output itself. Uh, perhaps in stacks and Polaroid, um, uh, and these days you can get miniature, yeah, you know, pocket-sized dye sublimation printers and things like that. Um, very rarely do you see people smile more than when they get given uh, a, an Instax or a Polaroid. It's so well, interesting. I, 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 I think you're you're right, and, and early days. Um, I think I've said this before on the podcast, but I I was given an SX70 by Polaroid before they came out, a pre-production model to test. Ooh. 
with a, a just a, a a ton of film. They had they had this artists program where they would, uh, where they would give those cameras and film to artists so to generate I was, some buzz. Yeah, so I you was, were part I, of that. Awesome. Yes, I was part of that. And so what did I do with it? I took it to Guatemala with me. And I, I don't know if any of you have been there, but I walked around Lake Atitlan. And, and in those days, uh, Lake Atitlan, it, it wasn't the tourist arena that it is today. Uh, but as I walked around, I, I took uh, Polaroid SX-70s of the indigenous people that I had met, which were, they were living all in villages around Atitlan. And... I would take one for them and one for me, and then I would give it to them. <laughs> and believe me, nobody had ever seen anything like this, holding it in their hands and seeing an image of themselves up here uh, blew many minds. And, and uh, I think about a month later, I did that same circumnavigation of the lake, and many of them had sewn it into their clothing. Mm -hmm. the pictures and it, it's funny because uh, I had kept a whole pile some I gave to Polaroid uh, obviously but I think the last time I had kind of opened uh, my little kind of box of these ancient uh, Polaroid images <laughs> they had basically dried and crumpled no dead. In other words, they were not archival in any way. And it just was, they were brittle. At first, they had that crackler that was reminiscent of, of uh, you know, you know uh, 16th century paintings with, you know, how, and then, of course, it just went just on and on until there yeah. were nothing. But again, it's that document versus image um kind of connection, which I, th I thought was very, very interesting. And uh, here I've been on location for the last, you know, a couple months more. Um, but I brought with me a little Instax Square printer so I can just keep my printing Jones alive. And I've printed hundreds of, of images, um, mainly that I've created through, and I will not speak its name, AI, but... <laughs> 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 but but some of them are absolutely marvelous and i encourage uh you adrian on your forthcoming trip to bring a little printer along because it is it doesn't take much room you can get the film pretty much anywhere and it's oh, it's a it's a really really fun thing and i've given a lot of these away you know, to crew and cast and, and you know, just as, as small documents. and It's a memento, yeah. yeah. It is. It's great. It's, it's amazing. I mean, I have seen people. Um, I remember, Chris, when we were in Bhutan in 2017. Oh, yeah. One, 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 of, one of our group yes, brought, I remember. brought with him what at the time actually was a, a very new thing. It was um, it was the first of the digital Instax camps. So where they have a small digital sensor, but basically you print onto the Instax. It's a and printer built taking, into the camera, yes. Yeah, yeah. and, and uh, yes, built into the camera. And uh, we, we were fortunate enough to, to tour a school. If you can imagine such a thing, a group of tourists being allowed into school classrooms. I mean, you know, clearly not in the Western world. Um, but they were, <laughs> they were ever so pleased to see us. They were very, very welcoming indeed. Uh, and uh, and then afterwards, you know, school broke out, and uh, yeah, we were taking photos with the kids, and uh, and the, yes, our our, um, our group member was giving them the Instax prints, and they were just marvelling at it. They, they they thought it was the most amazing thing. I mean, they they'd seen similar in yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, pretty much everybody in Bhutan has smartphones the same as we do, but yeah, so uh, so very different from your situation, perhaps, Jeremiah. But still, the gift of the photo was an amazing thing. So yes, I have um, I, I have uh, an Instax printer, which is definitely on my packing list. I'm humming and hawing with, with about five days to go whether or not I should order one that prints bigger Instaxes because I've got the I've got one that prints the mini Instax. The square ones squ are nice. The square ones yeah. are really beautiful, and and because you can, they work really well with your phone. They work uh, off yes. the, very very well with. <laughs> so I will I will be stopping it. my. <laughs> My first stop is in Calgary, so uh, when we when we fly out there, so I imagine I will be popping into. Uh, there's actually for for people who watch YouTube videos about photography, there's a very famous 
camera shop in Calgary called the Camera Store, um, and uh, the the started it was the place where um, uh, Chris Nichols and Jordan Drake, who now I think are on the Petapixel channel, started out because they both they they met there. They both worked in that shop. Uh, very you know, famous camera YouTubers or photography YouTubers. So uh, yes, I will probably pop in there when we get into Calgary and buy. 10 packs of Instax or something like that just yeah. to, to see me as, yeah, for, for a few weeks. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. All right. So alternative processes, definitely part of the future of photography. Absolutely. All right. How about some picks? Let me, let me start this with one. Well, not, not a pick, but just a reminder. Um, cyanotype is the easiest accessible one for everyone and if you go on your favorite shopping website and type in cyanotype paper you can get like 40 sheets of cyanotype paper including some acrylic sheets to weigh some things down that you put on the paper for like 12 bucks so That's this dense. stuff is dirt cheap and so much fun for for a sunny afternoon with your kids and yeah just just go ahead and do that that's so uh, shout, shout out at this point to my friend Rachel, who I do the Sunny Sixteen podcast with, because she makes cyanotype yes. kits as well, beautiful handmade oh, awesome. cyanotype kits awesome. uh, that you know, that you can use as uh, right. they're very handy as gifts as well, so for people. So um, very yeah, true. For anybody who would like to gift a cyanotype kit, especially now that it's summer, and you can also find them under the name Sunprint paper. So yeah. <laughs> um, no, but the, the 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 thing I wanted to talk about that um, the alternative inks reminded me of is a German company called Farbenwerk which would translate to Colorworks um, and what they do is they have alternative inks for a whole bunch of Epson printers Oh, interesting. So I have I've seen printed. these in action and what, what, what we're talking about is different kinds of black and white inks um, and uh um, pretty much a very well thought out process that uh, I've seen in action uh, in May on this big workshop that we do every year, in the old Abbey. So we ended up, uh, one of the participants ended up bringing their Epson printer and um, you, I, th I think you buy one of these sets of inks for that printer. Like, like he had never had anything else in there. He bought that and then threw away the inks that it came with and installed these right away. And um, this is not sponsored whatsoever, but the results that came out of that printer with these inks for not a lot of money, we're talking about an entire set of inks was under 200 euros. So um, if you've been working with very <coughs> advanced, specific rips and, and inks and things, um, th then you know that that is not very uh, very expensive. So this ended up being a very good alternative to these. Um, I'm I don't know where they send, where they ship, um, possibly worldwide because it's a .dot com address. So um, might be uh, worth looking into. Fabbergat .com. We'll put the link in the show. Are, are they archival in any way? Have they been tested? Um, there's all? so much information on the website. It will probably be in there somewhere. But um, Interesting. Yeah, it's a very interesting uh, product. And, um, and if you look at some of the Epson printers that it works with that are under 500 bucks, so you end up with 250 bucks uh, with a, with a custom-made black and white solution with... Uh, oh. Specific nice. things. So, and and again, five black and white, different tones, grays, and stuff. So you have a very, very nice uh, spread of tones in there. So it's so. like a poor man's piezo, really. It is, yes, it is. So, and the results were amazing. You have, to have you, you can, yeah. uh, like they they offer profiles, ICC profiles, and whatever you want, even even test prints. So you can offer order like a. a Sample to make sure some samples, yeah. All right, um, Jeremiah, you brought us something, yeah. Oddly, <laughs> <laughs> whoops, I'm, alternative I'm, photographic. I'm, I'm staying on message. This is a book that I, I have, I highly recommend it. It is inspirational and and uh, it, it covers a, just a variety of different image making processes. 
uh, processes and um, highly recommend it. And, and I want everyone to note that I didn't kind of put it into the uh, Amazon basket, but I did put it into the Freestyle 75. This is a Photoshop that has a lot, and when I say a lot, I mean a lot of gear specific to um, oh, yes. alternative processes. The people are absolutely amazing. Uh, they will work with you. They even create uh, all kinds of personal um, uh, profiles for your printer and inks, and, and they will work one-on-one oh, on one with you to create all manner of things. It is And the, the stuff they have at this place, is, I've never seen anywhere Toner else. Toner powder. I mean, and it's, it's in Hollywood. Um, Colloid so liquid, tintype parlor kits. Anything you can think of. Sunprint paper, here. There you, you go. Well. Uh, and also, you know, just uh, film holders if you're going to do your own um, uh, scanning, but very specific high-end makes. Uh, they even have something that I I don't know if any of you have had, ever had issues where you're printing a large uh, piece of paper through an inkjet and it picks up a little ink on the edges. Um, very, very upsetting to someone like me. Um, and that's because there's a little kind of curve. They sell a, a, actually something that you roll your paper through and it flattens it so that you don't even have that kind of thing. Uh, wow. They sell all manner of paper. They um, sell uncoated paper. So if you want to do your own coating, there you yes. go. Yes. Uh, this is a, if you're into platinum, this is the place to go. Um, so, you know, and I, I suspect they ship everywhere. Um, but also they're very... Uh, responsive. If you ever you have questions, just call them up, um, speak to them. They respond by email. They're a unique and fabulous. I, I'm not even going to call. They're not a camera store. <laughs> they're a photographic process store. Yeah, um, looks, looks, looks very, very cool. interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a, worth a deep dive. It's a great rabbit hole, and uh, it's a wonderful place. So. Well. Adrian? No, wait, you said you did. <laughs> no, I do. I, I put one in the show notes actually while we've been talking. So uh, if you. Out. If, yeah, if, if in doubt, take a minute out during the podcast recording to find a pick of the week. <laughs> it's already page not found. <laughs> That's it. That's oh, no, fantastic. wait, wait. Two of them. That's two of them. I, I put. I, I, uh, yes, so, so there, were two, there were two links in, in the show notes. So, so same, okay, same thing, just two different First websites. One coming up. So, so this is the uh, wet plate collodion work of a friend of mine called Simon Riddell. Um, he, uh, this, the, and this particular project he calls Mental Collodion. And uh, that photo there is, is Simon uh, that you're, you're uh, um, looking at there, Chris. Uh, so Cy so si has PTSD from some traumatic uh, events in his past. And uh, he... Uh, suffers quite badly uh, with his mental health. Um, he has very, very down periods. I'm not talking at tales out of school here. Um, he actually does talks on this stuff, so you know, I, I'm not sharing secrets. Um, but in one of his very uh, down periods, one of his very dark periods, he started experimenting with metal collodion imagery, um, uh, li literally in his garage, right? Uh, and um, he took some images uh, of himself, primarily um, some pretty harrowing images. Some yes. of them, um, yeah. This is this is this this comes from a disturbed mind, um, and he he will be the first person to say that. Um, and uh, having then shared some of this work, um, he then found that other people who were having uh, who had issues with PTSD and other mental health issues. Uh, came to him and and he would do photographs or I should say yeah uh, images uh, collodion images of, of them um, and uh, and so the mental collodion uh, project was born um, this is his website the other link actually is to the the write up in the Royal Photographic Society of size work on this project um, and um, yeah I've seen him do talks to, to groups of people uh, on this project and the work and and how he felt and how it impacts mental health 
very very powerful stuff wow, yeah. so when jeremiah was talking earlier on about how you know that sometimes the process can be very strongly linked to the the create you know, the the imagery and also to the emotion that goes behind it this is the uh, the project that popped up into my brain and uh, the collodion word plate brings that out that's amazing it certainly does, does, does yeah, yeah. Uh, those, those are um it, uh, yeah those are powerful images very yeah. powerful yeah. well so maybe maybe we we inspired some of you out there to get your fingers wet and get your hands on some of those processes so it's and cyanotype all, again first one and to we look all, at we only mentioned we won't really say oh it's it. only a AI fraction I, of what's out five there five times yes. <laughs> no yes, we only yes, mentioned yes. AI five times now six tip of the iceberg <laughs> No, um, and uh, the drinking game. Yeah, next time we'll we'll hand out uh, a bingo card or something. So if I've got five seconds to just say uh, Go see ahead. you later, Quick. folks, because uh, I'm just off on a big trip now, um, and I will be back on the show in about six weeks' time, I think, unless I get lucky and can dial in. From All right, that was ten seconds. <laughs> We are out. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Listening to the future of photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. dot